What if Nintendo's finally built an unhackable console? No homebrew, no custom firmware, nothing. This thing was hyped as Nintendo's most secure console ever and so far it's living up to that reputation. In today's video we're peeling back the curtain on the Switch 2's unhackable security. How did Nintendo lock this system down so tightly? What new encryption chips and locked bootloaders are keeping hackers out? And will it ever be hacked? Stick around because we're going deep into the Switch 2 security fortress and trust me, you'll want to know what's inside. Remember the original Nintendo Switch? That thing was a hacker's playground, it had a massive piracy problem, mothers were playing Nintendo's own games weeks before release. The homebrew scene on Switch 1 was huge because security flaws made it easy to exploit and Nintendo definitely took notes from that fiasco. Fast forward to the Nintendo Switch 2 release in early June 2025 and hackers everywhere are asking can we crack this one too? But early reports hinted that Nintendo learned from their mistakes and anticipated all the usual hacking tricks. Spoiler, those reports were absolutely right. In fact, Nintendo claimed the Switch 2 was their most secure console yet. Some even called it unhackable. For a while, it really looked that way, until about 24 hours after launch. Because, you know, the hacking community never sleeps. Within a day, a well-known hacker found the first ever exploit on the Switch 2. But I mean, don't get too excited if you didn't heard about it. All he managed to do was to make a little floating green line show up on the screen. I know, it sounds trivial, but in hacker terms, that was the first crack in the Switch 2's armor. It was what we call a userland drop exploit, basically a clever trick to execute some code in a non-critical part of the system. Important, this wasn't a full jailbreak or anything close, it didn't grant full system control or let you run pirated games. But it proved one thing, even the unhackable Switch 2 isn't perfectly secure, there were tiny vulnerabilities to be found. So why are we still waiting on a real jailbreak? Why is that little green line exploit the only thing hackers have to show so far? The answer is that Nintendo dramatically upgraded their security game this generation. Layered hardware security, secure boot and encryption. The Switch 2's brain, its system on chip, is a new Nvidia based design reportedly from the Ampere architecture family. In plain English, this chip was built with security in mind from the ground up. All the known exploits that made the original Switch hackable, Nintendo and Nvidia went through and patched every single one in hardware. For example, the original Switch's most infamous flaw was a bug on its boot ROM. Remember the Fusey Jolie exploit? That was essentially an unpatched door left open. On Switch, to that door is slammed shut. No similar USB recovery bug exists, at least none found yet. The console's bootloader is locked tight from the very first instruction. Here's how secure boot works on Switch 2. When you press the power button, an on-chip boot ROM read-only code takes over. It will only load the next stage bootloader if that code is official and untempered. And how does it check? Cryptographic signatures. Nintendo has baked public key signatures into the boot process. The boot ROM looks for a Nintendo digital signature on the firmware using keys burned into the hardware fuses. And if the signatures doesn't match, the console simply won't boot that code. So in Switch 2, each console has a unique secure boot key fused into the chip. That key, combined with a device specific factor, is used to derive other encryption keys internally. This means even if hacker dumped one console's keys, it wouldn't help them hack another console. So every unit is cryptographically unique. The bootloaders and firmware are encrypted per device and can only be decrypted with keys inside a specific Switch 2. It's like each Switch 2 has its own secret codebook that outsiders can read. And on top of that, Nintendo likely included a secure encryption chip or coprocessor on the motherboard. In the original Switch there was a security engine, the TSEC, built into the Tigra processor. The Switch 2 continues this idea with an updated Tigra security coprocessor and ARM Trust Zone technology. This secure enclave handles sensitive tasks in an isolated environment. It generates and stores encryption keys that even the main system can't directly access. For example, the TSEC can hold the root keys and perform cryptographic checks without exposing those keys to any hackable software. So even if you compromise the operating system, the secret keys remain safe in the secure module. Essentially, Nintendo added an extra lockbox inside the console, you'd have to crack that too to get anywhere. So hackers suspect that certain keys like those for decrypting games or firmware might even reside in a dedicated secure chip. 
separate from the main CPU, making them even harder to extract. Each Switch 2 might carry its own untouchable vault of secrets. Software Fort Knox, Horizon OS signatures and sandboxing. Okay, so the hardware is bulletproof. But Nintendo didn't stop there. The software site, the Switch 2's operating system called Horizon OS, is also locked down like Fort Knox. Only Nintendo's signed code can run on the system, period. Every single piece of the OS and every game is encrypted and signed. If you try to alter even one byte, the digital signature fails and the system will reject it. This is actually insanely huge. It thwarts typically hacks where you would say patch the system to run custom code. No signatures equals to no run. They've also hardened the OS against exploits. The Switch to Horizon OS used a microkernel architecture with strong isolation. All the drivers, services and apps run in user mode, in their own little sandboxes. Remember that green line hack? It was in user land, meaning the code ran in a restricted sandbox with no access to critical system functions. Nintendo's design makes sure that even if a hacker gets into one part of the system, they can't easily jump into deeper control. Now, there's ASLR, Address Space Layout Randomization in Play 2. That means the memory layout is randomized so exploits can't reliably find the function they want to hijack. They've enabled Hardware NX, no execute, bits on memory so you can't just shove malicious code into data memory and run it. All these are modern security practices, things you would expect in a smartphone or high security OS, now on a Nintendo console. The original Switch OS had some of these features as well, but Switch 2 takes it to the next level with even stricter enforcements. Hackers are finding far fewer mistakes to exploit in Horizon OS this time around. And another clever move, Eve uses enforced updates, Nintendo doesn't want to repeat of the old Switch situation where people stayed on vulnerable firmware to use exploits. So in Switch 2, whenever you update the system, certain e-fuses, electronic fuses, get irreversibly burned to record that update. So if you try to roll back to an older firmware after that, the system will detect a fuse mismatch and refuse to boot. So you can't downgrade to a hackable version once you've updated. Which means a favorite trick of the hacking scene is effectively blocked. So Nintendo's basically saying if by some miracle a jailbreak is found on version X, we'll make sure no one can just downgrade later to use it. It's a one-way street which pressures hackers to find exploits on the latest firmware, which is way harder. Lockdown hardware and anti-tempering measures. Nintendo also deployed new tricks in the physical hardware to thwart typical hacking methods. A big one, the Switch 2's USB-C port and docking protocol are now completely locked down with encryption. On the original Switch, the USB-C port was a minor backdoor. It's how the famous RCM hack was delivered via an unofficial dongle. For Switch 2, Nintendo wasn't taking chances. They added a proprietary chip and handshake protocol between the console and its dock. So the console won't even output video to a dock unless it exchanges over 30 cryptographically coded messages to authenticate the connection. This means third-party dogs and any unofficial devices initially just did not work. The Switch 2 would refuse to talk to them. Nintendo literally encrypted the USB-C interface. It reveals Nintendo's broader strategy. Control every point of contact. By locking down the USB port, they not only protected their accessory revenue, but also closed an avenue for hardware exploits. Any mode chip or exploit device that would interface through USB now has to overcome that encryption layer. It's an extra wall to climb for hackers attempting hardware mods. Speaking of hardware mods, on the upgraded Switch 1 models, hackers resorted to mode chips that glitch the processor at just the right time to bypass security. It's likely Nintendo's anticipated this too for Switch 2 this time. The new hardware is probably more resistant to voltage glitching or clock manipulation. We don't have details for obvious reasons Nintendo won't tell, but given how much effort went into everything else, you can definitely bet the timing windows for any glitch attack are much tighter now. Some in the modding community are speculating that if a full Switch 2 hack ever happens, it might require a sophisticated mode chip, if it's possible at all. Active defense, ban hammers and bounties. Nintendo security isn't just about building walls, it's also about actively monitoring and responding to threats. Early adopters who tried to tinker with the Switch 2 learned this the hard way. There's have been multiple reports of console bans already, hackers who've tried to use the same old tricks like flash cartridges to load backup games got hit with instant online bans. And that's exactly what happened. So Nintendo has clearly upgraded their detection system to spot tempering or non-standard hardware. So even if you find a way to run homebrew offline, 
going online could be a one-way ticket to ban land. And get this, Nintendo is proactively hunting down exploits via a bug bounty program. There's even a rumor floating around that a hacker found a major vulnerability in the Switch 2 security and instead of publishing it, they reported it to Nintendo's bounty program. The rumor claims this exploit could even execute code before the console's operating system fully loads, which would be huge if true, but if it's been reported to Nintendo, that means two things. One, Nintendo is likely working on a patch already, and two, we might never see that exploit publicly. So Nintendo basically paid to keep it quiet and fix it behind closed doors. This shows how serious Nintendo is about maintaining the Switch to secure reputation. They're willing to shell out cash bounties to hackers who disclose flaws, ensuring those cracks get sealed fast. Anytime a new exploit is found, Nintendo can deploy a system update to squash it, and thanks to those Eve users, they'll make sure you can't just avoid updating. It's a cat and mouse game, but Nintendo currently has the upper hand and they are playing for keeps. So where does that leave us? Well, as of now, the Switch 2 truly seems to be the toughest nut to crack in console history. We have no public jailbreak, no custom firmware and only a few minor userland exploits that don't give much power. Nintendo's multi-layered approach from secure silicon and encryption to locked bootloaders to OS level protections to active network policing has set a new standard for console security. Hackers are nothing if not persistent, given enough time everything gets hacked eventually, but it might take years or a stroke of genius or a costly hardware mod to finally crack the Switch 2. There's even a chance that by the time someone figured it out, Nintendo could be on the Switch 3. I mean, who knows? So is the Switch 2 truly unhackable? No, nothing is unhackable. So far, it's looking that way, yes, but we are just one month in. And I also think that it is a very good and crucial step to understand which walls we need to crack in order to get into the system inside. If you found this video informative, do me a huge favor, hit that like button and consider subscribing to Better Gaming for more insights on console modding and tech. I love exploring this stuff with you guys and your support really helps the channel grow. Let me know in the comments what you think about everything because it's a very very interesting topic. Don't forget to smile, my name is you, I hope I'll see you in the next video. Peace.